All right, everyone, I think we'll go ahead and kick things off. So thank you for joining our presentation today on how Cornell uses Docker Data Center to simplify production deployments. I'm Chris Hines here from Docker. We're joined with our special guest presenter today, Sean Bauer. So Sean, thanks for being here. No problem, thanks for having me. Of course, of course. So Sean is a cloud architect at Cornell University. Um, so before we kick things off, I just wanted to remind everyone that this presentation today is being recorded. So what we'll do is we'll follow up with you um, later on this week or early next week via email, and we'll include the link to this recording within it. So you can go ahead and give it another listen, or you can share it with anyone that you would like as well. Also, uh, towards the end of this presentation, we'll save maybe about 10 or 12 minutes, so you can go ahead and ask any questions that you'd like. Um, you can ask questions throughout the presentation by using the WebEx portal. There's a little Q&A section there, so you can go ahead and post questions as they come up, and we'll try to address as many as we can uh, towards the end. All right, so we did a survey earlier this year in Q1 of 2016 to understand um, what are the, some of the key initiatives taking place um, within teams today, right, DevOps teams. And um, we found that three of the ones that really stood out were microservices, cloud, and DevOps. So we look at things like microservices where we move to these loosely coupled together services that um, kind of form together moving from monolithic applications or legacy applications to these microservices apps. And it turns out that uh, three out of four of the people that we spoke with, um, their top initiatives actually revolve around these microservice applications. Also, when you look at cloud, 80% of participants in surveys um, said that um, Docker is central to their cloud strategy, right? So they're looking to do things like adopt cloud or um, have these multi-cloud environments where they might be made up of both AWS and Azure, or they might be trying to move from OpenStack to AWS, or whatever the case might be. Um, then you have DevOps, which is really this kind of cultural um, motion of breaking down that traditional barrier that has existed between developers and IT operations teams. And when we asked them, it said that you know 44% are actually looking to go DevOps, which is something that's really interesting to us. Um, and then we, when we looked at challenges, one of the, the number one challenge really was um, too many resources being used to actually go out and maintain existing applications. Right? So knowing this, what we've done is we've, we've built our solutions in a way that helps enable these initiatives to take place while keeping that major challenge in mind. So that brings us to Docker containers as a service. So you might have heard this, it's uh, this term called CAS. Right? I know there's a lot of Passes or passes are out there, and it's kind of like, <laughs> how do we know what the difference is between them, right? So, Docker Containers as a service, um, what it does is it enables IT operations teams to actually go out and control and manage their environment, right? That's what they're tasked to do. But at the same time, what it enables developers to do is actually go out and self service, right? And, and in a self service way. So, they can go out and build applications without feeling that they're being infringed upon by the IT operations team. At the same time, the IT operations team can ensure that um, there's security and manageability over their environment. Right? It's something that maybe developers aren't always keeping top of mind. So what we've done is we've created a solution called Docker Data Center. Right? So Docker Data Center um, delivers containers as a service. It's built to give IT ops control and developers the flexibility to go out and build their applications. Right? So we sold it. As, we sell it as a bundle. Or, so basically, it's, it includes the engine. This comes with support for the engine. It's essentially the container runtime um, with you know, the new release of 112. It has built-in orchestration as well as networking and volumes and plugins. Um, we built this platform to be super pluggable. Right? The thing you see here in blue is part of the actual Docker product set. The green re represents the plugins that are available. Um, so it comes with you know, Docker Trusted Registry being the on-premises registry. This is essentially where you store and secure image content. It also provides secure collaboration for anyone who's trying to interact with that content, right? So in the, in the case of containers, it would be the image content itself. Um, matter of universal control plane, uh, or UCP for short. And this is actually the management layer here um, within Docker Data Center. It's a thing that actually helps deploy, manage, and scale applications across your Dockerized environment. And of course, security, right? We realize that enterprise teams, you know, Teams like Sean as well at Cornell are looking for a secure platform, right? It has that built-in security aspect of it so they can be compliant. Um, so we have um, the ability to control not only the platform, but 
the content and the access to that content as well. So we have tools like uh, role-based access, access controls so you can control you know, who has access to what. Um, there's built-in integration with LDAP and AD so you can quickly create teams and apply role-based access controls to those teams. Um, also things like Docker Content Trust, which is uh, an image signing technology so you can ensure that the latest version of an image is running in production and ensure that no one has actually gone out and tampered with image content as well. And then the plugability. So I won't go through each of these here, um, but we have plugins with you know, networking, volumes, CI, CD. So plugins with you know, um, tools like um, GitHub or Bitbucket, uh, monitoring and logging. So plugins with companies like Splunk. Um, the really cool thing about the engine and, and what, you know, from our customers, what we've heard is that the flexibility that the engine provides, the fact that it can run in any infrastructure type, right? It could be the public cloud, it could be in a private cloud, or it can be in any physical converged environment as well. Um, we've realized that you've already invested in infrastructure. So our goal is not to ask you to go and pull that out, but instead be able to plug into it instead and leverage your existing to just better utilize it in a way by leveraging Docker and Docker Data Center. So um, this is a quick look at the workflow. We call this the Docker Cast Overview. Um, this is right from you know build, ship, run as you go from left to right. Um, so on the left, you have a developer who's going out and building an application. They create an image, right? The, they Dockerize it, create that image. Then that image needs to be stored somewhere, and we store it in the registry, right? And that's again the ship portion of it. So it's all tasked with, about, with securing the content and providing that secure collaboration. And then when you already actually go and run that application in production, you'd use universal control plane. So you pull that image out of Docker Trusted Registry and then run it within universal control plane. Um, so you have the flexibility to run it in the cloud or you can run it on premises. And you also have the portability of, that the containers provide to actually move those workloads uh, between your on-premises and cloud environment. Uh, it's important to realize that now, as you see, the developers and the IT operations teams are, are both involved here heavily, right? So this is enabling DevOps, if you will. Um, so the handoff point being that ship piece where the developer has already created the app, place that image in the registry, and then the IT ops team can go in and, and pull it and run it in production. So uh, with that point, what I'll do is I'll just pass it over to Sean, who's going to talk about Cornell University and their use of Docker Data Center. So Sean, let me pass the ball over to you. and. You can go ahead and share your screen or share your application whenever you'd like. Sure, we will do. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so who, who are we? We're Cornell University. We've been around for 150 years. So we just uh, celebrated our anniversary, I think, last year. It was pretty exciting. Um, <clears throat> Cornell, mission, this is right from our charter, is learning, discovery, and engagement, uh, not supporting wikis. So uh, this is uh, in reference to a blog post I recently wrote um, for a guest spot on, on Docker. Uh, our, our mission is, is not uh, supporting administrative applications. Um, our mission is, is to help uh, students and faculty at Cornell um, meet the goals of learning, discovery, and engagement. So one of the ways that Docker has helped us is to become more agile in the way we support our administrative systems so we have more time to support the actual mission of uh, Cornell. Um, so when we talk about uh, customers of Cornell, it's, it's really an interesting landscape. Um, we have a large internal customer base. A lot of um, what we do is, uh, facing our faculty, staff, and students. Um, <clears throat> we have applications now running in, uh, in the cloud and in Docker that range from um, supporting our College of Agricultural Life Science programs to our dining hall network um, to our financial system. So it, it's pretty broad uh, across the university internally. Um, externally, uh, we really interface with the world. Um, we have projects on campus. Um, like archive.org, which is a, a very large uprint um, repository uh, for physics and mathematics papers, and it's, um, I think, one of the, the number one uprint repositories. Um, 14 million papers are downloaded every month from that. Um, there's another project on campus that we worked with, uh, eBird, 
um, they track uh, bird sightings around the world, and they have 9.5 million um, records every month. Um, so we, we have a, a, a pretty large and diverse customer set. The journey to doctor for, is kind of interesting for us. So um, ITO Cornell used to be a uh, solar shop. So um, before, well, maybe not before, but before LFC was big, um, you know, solar zones was a, a pretty uh, a cool concept that came along, and we really got into it, um, and we were using that um, quite a bit on our, our clusters and using zone technologies to uh, carve out space for each application and keep them separate. Um, but as times change, we, we realized that moving off of Solaris and into uh, Linux platforms um, had huge cost savings potentials just from the hardware and whatnot. But uh, we took notice of, of this, this tiny little company called Dot Cloud and what they were doing um, because it felt a lot like Zones. Um, so when the initial release of Docker um, came out back in 2013, we were definitely looking looking at it and, and kind of intrigued and, and trying to figure out how we could incorporate that into what we do at Cornell. You know, we, we were looking at, um, you know, it was a good uh, confluence of events, really. We were looking at that time, um, how we were going to build uh, the new world. So we have gone from Flares uh, shop to a Linux shop to, um, you know, all bare metal to virtualization. And we wanted to look at what, what, what is the new world, right? So how do, we, how do we prepare for the next stage, which is really, um, you know, the cloud. Uh, we wanted to address problems that I'm sure everyone's organization has, which is I would call the, the server drift. We have dev machines that didn't match test machines, that didn't match prod machines. But worse than that, we had prod machines in our prod clusters that didn't match each other, right? So there's just this, this continual drift, and we needed a way to kind of address that. Um, and we are tired of complex deployments, very manual deployments or, or multi-step deployments, things that always broke down in the release cycle, and we wanted a way to, to kind of, um, you know, address that. So our first production workload uh, went live in uh, 2014, October 2014 on Docker. Um, today we, we have hundreds of, of workloads that are in production using the Docker technology. So some of our initial t challenges, spending too much time caring for our pets. So um, um, hopefully pe people are familiar with the pets versus cattle analogy. Um, we definitely uh, fully adopted that. Um, we were spending a lot of time uh, patching and, and loving and caring and making sure we stay for college so our servers could one day grow up and lead, you know, glorious lives. Um, and unfortunately, that was not, you know, a, a very good way to spend our time. Um, so one of the things that we found super intriguing about Docker was, was uh, the ability to kind of really take uh, a hold of mutable infrastructure. Um, so when we first uh, got to Docker, um, one of the biggest problems we had was uh, folks with SSH in the machine make some changes, didn't get recorded anywhere. And we didn't know, you know, what was changing over time. We, we had no good um, structure for managing that. Um, and one of the things we found super intriguing was like uh, with uh, pre uh, Docker 1.3, uh, there was no way to change uh, a, a running container. So uh, as long as we turned off SSH, no one could go in there and change anything on it. Uh, of course, now Docker exactly exists, and that's not true, but uh, that's okay because we, we like the ability to debug, and it's, it's definitely a good feature. Um, yeah, so we need to eliminate server drift. Um, we want the portability across uh, environments, dev and test, um, and we want our clusters to be consistent. And we had developers coming to us and talking about microservices, and quite frankly, it scared the crap out of us. We, we were trying to uh, understand in the world we lived in where there was high touch maintenance and, and we'd, we'd employ tools like Puppet and Chef um, to kind of uh, help address that problem. But it, it still was, um, the deployment process was complex and uh, things drifted and, and there wasn't a way to manage that. So the idea of managing, uh, taking a monolithic application and breaking it into its component services um, to us sounded great on paper and we could totally see why uh, developers wanted to do it, but it scared us from an operational standpoint of how 
will we keep everything in sync and how will we manage so many services, right? We, we didn't have a very large group and um, we were having enough issues managing our monolithic applications, let alone 80 small applications. Um, and this is where, where uh, Docker really started to help us, right? So we were able to start creating these tiny little services that were all these self-contained environments. And um, if you guys haven't seen this, this is kind of the, here's how you adopt microservices using Docker, right? Uh, so we were uh, able to do strong modularization, totally small de uh, deployment units. Um, and this is all driven by the fact that we could create these things and bundle them up into um, an image and then use Compose to compose those image, uh, images into a, a set of running containers. Um, and through this process, we were actually um, able to uh, launch one of our uh, newest uh, projects that um, is live in the cloud. It's a, a product called PI Dashboard. Um, it's used by um, principal investigators who are trying to manage the grants and uh, funding for their, for their um, research projects. And um, so we adopted the strategy of um, having that, that uh, project structure where we have our Docker Compose YAML file that uh, sits in the root directory that, that describes the entire service and then each microservice underneath that with a Docker file that describes that individual little um, service. Uh, this also gave us an advantage that we hadn't anticipated, which was the ability to have version stacks. So uh, what we mean there is that, you know, this was giving us the version, uh, ability to have, um, oh, in a lot of our environments, we have um, an Apache that is used for um, our authentication, our single sign-on authentication layer that's homegrown uh, that reverse proxies to an application server, whether that's Rack or Tomcat or whatever. Um, and uh, we have a database and, you know, maybe a Redis server um, involved in that, in that stack. And that, now we can actually version the entire stack at a, at a point in time or a, a deployment. Um, you know, we often version things based on Git um, you know, SHA commits. But we, we could we could take that and, and and now we have the ability to to roll back or we have the ability to deploy the stack as you know as a version piece of infrastructure to multiple places. And this is, you know, incredible advantage for us. Um, it's something that as we look forward to things that are coming out in the Docker world, the uh, new Docker application bundle process um, is really intriguing to us because this is really how we are operating today with, you know, version stacks and uh, YAML files uh, using Compose. But it's going to make that um, um, process even more streamlined. Um, so currently at Cornell, we use uh, a, a lot of uh, services provided by Docker. We use, of course, the Docker engine. Um, but, uh, we <clears throat> And early on in our uh, project to kind of start uh, containerizing at Cordell, we reached out to Docker because we wanted to have some idea of, of um, how to take things from, you know, our initial um, kind of, uh, you know, getting started uh, environment to, to, to true production. So we initially, when we were, um, you know, coming up to the ramping of the speed on Docker, we were using the open source registry, which worked fine. Um, we were using, obviously, the open source um, um, engine, which was great. But we wanted to, you know, figure out how we were going to take that to the next level. So we engaged with them early and started talking about how we could move to their trusted registry project. And also, we were, we were pretty intrigued about getting engine support. So one of the, the things that the, uh, is great about Docker is that we're getting uh, – uh, new and better versions uh, very rapidly. So the fact that Docker is releasing, I think, practically every quarter is great. We love it, and we always like to play with the new stuff, uh, but it's just too fast for the general um, population here at Cornell. We need to be able to stay on a version longer um, than, you know, every quarter. So uh, it was a huge uh, bonus for us to be able to have a commercially supported engine where we could 
stay on a specific line and have um, bugs addressed in a timely manner on that specific um, patch line um, because we just don't have the ability to move as quickly as the open source community, unfortunately. Um, another big win for us is, you know, we also use uh, heavily the Docker uh, support. We not just support in the sense of using um, the engine and using the registry and submitting cases, but uh, we've tapped into the ability to um, work with Docker support for training opportunities. We work with them, um, have a technical account manager that helps us um, as we architect new projects and helps us um, understand what the product roadmap looks like for Docker um, and understand like best practices and how we might implement um, various edge case hard hard projects. And, you know, it, it, it support is great because it's, it's nice to be able to pick up the phone and have someone on the other end that's actually going to help you. Um, so it was, a, it was a big bonus for us to be able to become a customer of Docker and kind of um, be able to take advantage of these um, services beyond just the open source product. Um, and the Docker Trusted Registry is, is a big one for us. So we have um, uh, one registry that we use for many organizations across Cornell. Um, it allows us to have a central place for people to store images. Um, one of the things that we're definitely looking forward to in, um, you know, uh, the upcoming releases of uh, DTR and, and um, UCP is um, the ability to have the static scanning of images. So our security folks are uh, really delighted that we can um, have one of the big problems that we face as we're moving to the cloud is making that mind uh, switch from the old world to the new world of ephemerality, right? And the security folks have really been trying to look at tools to help us uh, do incident response and intrusion detection and all that good stuff, but um, in the world of ephemeral instances. Um, and they've actually started to see the advantage of containerizing. In fact, like at Cornell, we are now a container-first organization. Um, so one of the things that helps them address the, you know, uh, you know, issue of, of a very distributed, very ephemeral environment uh, and trying to understand what versions of Apache or Tomcat might be out there and might be vulnerable um, is that we can condense that down into making sure to scan the images in that registry. So if everyone's using uh, containers, and these containers are built by our central team and blessed by our security office, um, then we can we can feel good about those. But we also have the image registry there, so if people um, want to just use the registry to push and pull from and use their own images, they can do that. But now we also get that security view, and so if they do happen to have um, a CV that's on address in their image, we can we can help them address that essentially with a security office. So it's it's helping to address um, a lot of the security issues as we move to the cloud by um, bringing Docker and DTR into the picture. Um, I, I also know that uh, we're very uh, the security folks are very interested in uh, the new signature me mechanisms that are uh, part of Notary. Um, the ability for multiple teams to be able to cryptographically sign off on an image um, that can then be consumed by um, other organizations around Cornell um, is definitely going to be uh, a big one for us. Um, in fact, as I understand it, with UCP, we can actually um, set limitations on what images are allowed to uh, be deployed to our cluster based on whether those signatures have been met or not. So. If, these are, these are some of the things that we're definitely looking forward to. This is a kind of a high level um, depiction of how Docker fits into our ecosystem. Um, this is a look at how we use it in uh, our financial system. Um, we have Jenkins, which does a, a lot of, uh, which we use for all our CI, CD. Um, so on local machines, uh, we're running um, Docker images and testing and doing all sorts of good stuff. We push that code up to GitHub, uh, which Jenkins picks up, and um, you know kicks off the build process and test process. 
And if that build passes and all the tests passes, then we will push that to our Docker trusted registry. Um, and I won't, you know, won't get into a bunch of detail about the other stuff going on there, but you know, we have some jobs that are running to uh, update Route 53 and you know provide user data to VMs. Uh, a lot of our environments, we um, actually terminate all of our dev and test environments um, and rebuild them every day. So they only run nine to five essentially and we, we uh, bring them back up. This is where having a central trusted registry is, is fantastic for a sort of um, deployment uh, on demand. So we have the image as it was just uh, the day before, and we can pull that down the next morning and instantiate it and have um, the environment just as it was. Um, this also allows us uh, to patch those host OSs seamlessly by just swapping out the AMI that we use uh, when we bring things up the next day. Uh, we've gone from our on-premise uh, patching cycle was uh, twice a year. We go we do OS patching to, um, in the financial system, we do um, daily patching for dev and test and weekly patches um, to our production environment. So like I said, we, we use, well, uh, Docker Engine, Swarm, uh, Universal Control Plane, Docker Trust Registry. So we're, we're trying to take advantage of as many of the tools um, that Docker provides as we, as we possibly can. Um, we are currently running uh, 200 plus Docker nodes, and this, this seems to grow uh, every day. Um, we have 32 containerized applications in production, um, and uh, currently uh, we have over 1,000 containers running um, Cornell workloads on a daily basis. The more we use Docker, the more we see the benefits. Um, so we started out with a kind of uh, the whole immutable infrastructure and wanted to address the server with a, a server drift problem. Um, so the, the ability to seamlessly deploy to production across environments was big for us. But then as we've used it more and more, we see huge advantages in the security space. Um, so the secure image storage and ability to comply with industry standards is huge. Again, totally a um, big win for us is looking forward to um, baked in uh, static scanning and signing in, into DTR. Um, and one of the questions we get asked is, you know, why, why do we choose Docker Data Center? And as we've been working to move to the cloud, um, you know, we're definitely about an containerization and we're definitely like it's a container first. Um, but then we also want to be able to monitor these containers. We want to be able to do the static scanning and security of these containers. And there are other solutions out there, but they're disparate. The one thing that I think is a huge benefit for Docker Data Center is um, the fact that we can get all that in, in one, one place. So it's one stop shopping for us. So we're we're getting um, uh, the orchestration engine, we're getting um, the support of the Docker engines themselves, we're getting the static scanning and security pieces that we need, and we're not having to go out and get two or three or four different tools to compose together to, to make that happen. So that's, that's a huge win for us. Um, the portability of using Docker containers to move workloads across multiple environments. This is something where one of the, the uh, fundamental like things that we're trying to do as we build out uh, into the cloud is while we're primarily using AWS, we don't want to be locked into it. So we've actually you know, been able to run clusters across uh, our on-premise infrastructure in AWS, across our on-premise infrastructure, Azure and AWS. And, and that's one of the things that really is afforded to us, you know, using um, UCP and Docker. So if our workloads are containerized and can run in a cluster, then it, it really doesn't matter where that cluster lives or even if that cluster spans multiple cloud environments. Um, there's some you know, nice features on uh, with UCP with the ability to constrain where uh, images run. So uh, we've been able to use that to constrain the images to run uh, on AWS unless those uh, unless AWS nodes are down and then we can move them to Azure, right? So th there's a lot of um, flexibility in the way that uh, set up. Um, and, you know, we can utilize an infrastructure more efficiently by running containers within VMs. Um, we're not having, uh, when we 
originally looked at just using bare metal, uh, not bare metal, I'm sorry, just using uh, bare VMs um, and auto scaling groups in, in uh, Amazon. Uh, it was an effective strategy, but you, we uh, were taking that uh, launch time hit, right? So a lot of our stuff is Tomcat applications, which is, you know, a two minute launch on, on the JVM for Tomcat sometimes. And uh, in addition to that, we also have to wait, the, you know, five to seven minutes just to complete the boot cycle um, for the EC2 instance. In addition to whatever time it took us to get the response from EC2. So, um, you know, we become way uh, more efficient by being able to run a cluster and start these containers in whatever time it takes to start a process and not the overhead of, um, you know, the con uh, creation of the instance and the creation of, um, yeah, the entire boot process. We have seen projects complete three times faster than in the past, and I think this is a huge win for us that we weren't expecting either, where um, because we have a bunch of reusable architecture patterns, we're able to spin up um, like projects very quickly. Um, we use, like as a we use a lot of um, Apache reverse proxying to Tomcat, uh, and now that we have kind of that pattern, uh, you know, in code, uh, spinning up a new um, flavor of that, whether that's a homegrown application we use for identity management or whether it's, um, you know, we use El Asia Jira uh, for issue tracking, it's the same basic pattern and we can spin those projects up quicker and easier than we ever uh, were before. And we also have now a simplified build and deployment process. Um, so the ability that we could, uh, to build these images out automatically and deploy them out um, is much simpler now. And again, because this process is uh, more of a pattern, uh, we can we, we have a very generic set of Jenkins jobs that we can apply broadly to projects, um, and and that reusability makes our projects more agile. So beyond the benefits of just hardware and machine and uh, cycles and all that good stuff, um, we're actually seeing benefits on, on the agility in, in the projects themselves. Okay, so I'm gonna show a very uh, brief demo of an application that we have at Cornell and, and our deployment process. Typically, we would use um, Jenkins, uh, again, with, you know, a git push and all that good stuff uh, to do this, but for the sake of the demo, we'll just sort of uh, go through it manually. And then we'll take a quick look at uh, the UCP GUI and what it looks like in there, and I'll do a quick uh, scale out um, to show you really the ability, how, how quickly we can scale up the application. Okie dokie. So quickly, I'll show, uh, show you the application that we're talking about. This is the production version. Um, Cornell's Dropbox, which is not at all affiliated with Dropbox, the company or product, is uh, what we use for secure file transfer. Um, so to address the problem of people sending passwords in email or um, cryptographic keys in email or anything like that, we've created a simple application that allows you to find a person you want to send something to and then find that file and send it through uh, secure mechanisms. Um, so I'll show you the process by which we'll bring one up. So we're gonna bring up DB local, uh, Dropbox local, and you can see currently there's nothing running. Um, we have a very simple uh, composed file here. Um, that composed file is just going to grab our latest image. It's gonna expose um, port 80 and 443 and um, in that image, there's a start Apache shell script that's actually going to do the work of starting it. Um, so I'll quickly do a Docker PS. Uh, this is our UCP cluster. You can see that currently we're running um, a DTR image on this cluster. Um, that's all these guys here. Uh, so I can simplify that view by just looking at the not DTR and currently there's nothing running. So to compose, we'll give it a project name of Dropbox. Oops, I did something wrong. Oh. 
No, oh, okay, yeah, so spelling things correctly is paramount to success. So this is gonna go out and interface directly with our UCP cluster, creating this uh, container Dropbox. Uh, it's gonna automatically, you know, give it a, a this instance of the container a name of Dropbox underscore one. Okay, so. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay, so we can see this guy is running now. Um, I can see through the command line that this is running on UCP node three. Uh, you can do typical Docker commands um, using UCP, like I can look at the logs um, and all that uh, kind of good stuff. And so I'm gonna switch, switch over to the UCP GUI quickly. So in the GUI, you can see basic information about your um, container CPU usage, memory usage, and we can see the applications that we've launched. Um, so as I mentioned, like this, this UCP uh, cluster is also running uh, our Docker trusted registry, so you can see that application is this here, um, and you know you can see Dropbox, and um, as as it's shown in the command line, this is running on UCP node three. So if all went well, you can now see I, I have DB local running. It wasn't there before, but now it magically is. Um, the great part about using UCP is that um, I can simply uh, scale this uh, image now by just dropping the number of instances I want to scale to in here. And if all goes well, we'll get the little happy success uh, box. And then when we go back here, we'll see three running containers and that I'm running on UCP nodes one, two, and three now. And I should be able to go back here and, um, you know, refresh and there's there's no issues here. So um, this is, uh, again, usually an automated process. And you can see we're able to log in and, and use everything. Um, but this is the process we file for our production deployments and we have the ability to, you know, scale on demand and, and meet load. Um, and this is, you know, uh, it's been super effective for us. We also uh, do use things in UCP like uh, the role-based access control to only allow certain people to be able to deploy Dropbox, for instance. Um, so that's my quick demo. And I'll go back here. And I guess I, I must I must have been okay because the demo didn't go horribly. So thank you, demo guys. Um, for <laughs> for us, Docker uh, Docker is in the future. Like the future is so bright, we gotta wear shades. That's that's how we look at it. Uh, we're looking at uh, the better, a better cluster management tool that leverage Docker 112, and of course, Swarm World that was um, announced at uh, DockerCon this year. Every little use of UCP gets better than the last one, and, and um, like I said, we're definitely looking forward to uh, the security features that are coming. Um, our usage of DTR continues to grow. Um, we have, uh, at last count, 842 images in our repository over 20 organizations, um, and that continues to grow. So, um, and uh, one of the really cool parts for me is that we're running uh, a very active registry on a very small cluster of three um, uh, T2 and medium nodes. So um, the architecture is great. It's, it doesn't cost us a lot to run, um, and we're loving it. So. We're definitely looking forward to the future, um, being able to get signing, scanning, and set comp profiles, and um, enjoy the, the enjoyment and wonder of Docker 112. Um, 
we're also currently in the process of building our hybrid cloud solution, um, which will use uh, UCP to bridge our on-prem and AWS uh, infrastructure. And like I, I mentioned briefly, we're also looking at clusters that extend into Azure as well. Um, we're looking to help support, um, yeah, faster deployments using Docker application bundles is on our list uh, as well. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, we, we can't say enough uh, great things about Docker. It's a fantastic tool. And beyond that, it's a fantastic company to engage with. We've had um, great, great experiences uh, working with our team to uh, help us improve our, um, you know, product life cycle, as well as helping them to, you know, engage with them on their products as well. So it's a great partnership. Thank you so much, Sean. I appreciate, you know, the demo for taking us through how you're actually going out and using Docker Data Center and, uh, and the kind words. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, so I do have a bunch of questions that came in. This is really great. Thanks to everyone in the audience who's going out and posting these questions. Um, Sean, I think you might be able to see a few as well, but what I can do is I'll, I can, you know, run through a few and, you know, we can kind of tag team here if you have some responses or, or if not. But, um, so um, we have a question here for you, Sean. Um, so how many, how many nodes are running on your Swarm cluster? And Sean, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, no. So it's a it, it's a trick question, I think, because at Cornell we actually have many many clusters. Um, oftentimes we're we'll, you know we have a main UCP cluster which is running uh, 30 nodes at this point, um, which is used by the central organization for a lot of our applications. But we also have smaller units across uh, Cornell that are running uh, clusters for their uh, unit group. Okay. Um, another question just came in was, um, how are you managing, so how do you handle backup for persistent data if you're doing something around that now? Uh, for for our applications? Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, one of the big uh, moves for us as we kind of move to Docker in the cloud is to become as stateless as possible. So our persistent data is either stored in some sort of blob storage like Amazon uh, S3 or Azure's, whatever it's called, um, or we store it in um, some sort of database like Mongo or um, RDS, uh, a lot of Oracle on campus for us still, unfortunately. Um, but backups, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at, uh, for S3, we typically, you know, um, for DR purposes, we may uh, store a backup in a, in a different region. Um, for databases, we're just storing, um, you know, snapshots for RDS instances or um, just using um, the database-centric tools to kind of create a dump, and then we store those typically in S3. Okay, thank you. Um, so we had a question here around uh, how many Dockerized applications you have running right now. So currently in production, we have 32 applications that are Dockerized and running. We have another, um, I believe, 17 that are, that are um, Dockerized and ready in the next uh, two months to go live in production. And then uh, a myriad of folks that are starting the, the Docker journey, if you will. So. Uh, another question we got, and hopefully, you know, <laughs> let me know if there's questions that you don't want to answer or anything like that as well. It's fine. Um, sure. So, uh, what were the deciding factors to justify the expenditure for DDC versus leveraging the free open source offerings? And this is a question from Tim. Sure. Um, so, so there, there's definitely a lot of factors that go into that. I, I think I, I touched on, upon briefly that. Um, while the open source tools are fantastic, they, they often move uh, a lot quicker than we're able to adjust to. So being able to have a uh, normalized um, distribution uh, was important to us. So uh, having Docker Engine where we could have supported versions that were not just the latest. Um, and that if you're not familiar with it, uh, with uh, engine support from Docker, they support, I think, the previous two engines 
and you get if you find bugs or issues with it, they will patch it um, and turn that around very quickly. And uh, they have a commercial in, in their commercially supported line, and that was important to us. So we weren't um, relying on uh, you know when an pull request was going to get merged and if it was going to address a bug. We wanted to be able to address things rapidly when we found bugs, but also stay on uh, stable known releases. Um, the advantages for us, uh, a big one is, is having, um, again, the ability to pick up the phone call, the, the relationship with Docker, and um, having uh, someone there that actually is going to help us when, when things don't work right. Um, and then the, the tools themselves, uh, the trusted registry uh, is far more flexible now than the open source version. So, um, and we've, we've been able to help influence, um, you know, where the uh, trusted registry is going. So I think those are some of the big ones for us. Awesome. And I'll take this question. It's a question from uh, Dayanon. This, does the Docker scale feature leverage multiple machines within the local area network and local area cloud? So, so yes, it, it leverages any node under its management. So as long as it has like the reachability with the underlying engine, uh, it can schedule against it. So including the scaling feature within UCP. <clears throat> um, okay. So, uh, Sean, this is around maybe if we have a question here, does your team blog about your microservice deployment process? So, is there any way where they can go and kind of hear you know, firsthand kind of what you're doing or um, at Cornell? Sure. Um, we actually blog quite a bit about our general cloud experiences, including microservices. Uh, you can find that at blogs.cornell.edu slash cloudification. Okay, awesome. And if you want, you can just post that link maybe later on within the app. Well, that's here. Yeah, and I can do it. Go ahead. That'd be awesome. <clears throat> um, okay, there's a question around monitoring. So can you elaborate on how you're managing such monitoring uh, your cluster? So for AWS, we use a lot of the built-in CloudWatch monitoring. We've also been uh, using the data, uh, Datadog's tool that allows us more in-depth um, monitoring into the Docker stack, into the containers, uh, which has been very helpful for us. Um, it is it's definitely important to be able to get that view into not just the host machine, but actually what's going on inside your containers. Uh, we also have used uh, Cat Advisor, the open source project by Google, um, to kind of get some of that monitoring information out. Um, so by kind of collating that information together, that's how we kind of get the best monitoring pain, if you will. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I'm just scrolling through them here. There's so many questions that came in. <laughs> um, there's ones that you see as well, Sean, that you want to pick on. Let me know. I don't know if you have access to see them. But, um, okay. So do you have, are your clusters distributed between multiple data centers or um, within one data center? So we definitely have clusters that are uh, distributed across multiple data centers. Um, and in some cases, we actually have uh, distributed across cloud. Okay, and then there's a question around upgrades. So how are you managing upgrades? Do you do rolling upgrades at Cornell? Um, yes, so I'm, I'm not sure if that means the applications themselves or for the engine. Uh, yeah, I just the engine, question. yeah. I, I believe it's the engine. Oh, yeah. So we definitely do uh, rolling upgrades. Um, we, in, Amazon, in the Amazon world, we bake AMIs with the new engine in it and sort of roll those into our clusters and roll the old ones out, basically. Um, making sure to, you know, uh, roll, making sure that our UC management uh, nodes are uh, you know, done so that we keep, you know, a quorum of nodes up at any given time. And there's a question here from, I think, uh, a fellow university IT colleague, if you will, um, not cool. at Cornell, but of a university, it seems. So the question sure. is, what is your view and advice on the optimum sizing of the environment that would help kickstart um, uh, a Docker startup at, univers at a university? Uh, sizing of uh, the number of uh, sizing of the machines, or yeah, it's looking like node environment. Yeah, 
So if it's if it's AWS, like I think the the definite go to for us has been the T2 mediums, uh, giving us two uh, CPUs and four gigs of RAM for thirty five dollars a month, roughly. Um, it's very. Uh, we have a lot of uh, probably like other universities, a lot of old uh, legacy applications that require uh, a good deal more memory than um, than some of these uh, newfangled microservices. So uh, having that extra RAM has been kind of key for us. So that's kind of our sweet spot, anyway. Okay, awesome. Um, I'll ask a couple here now. I know we're coming up on that hour, um, so a couple more. So. Um, so, Sean, maybe if you could please clarify if you use any load balancers while running uh, an application across your multiple containers. Absolutely. So, um, I didn't dive into this too much, but uh, I know Docker has a paper on uh, how uh, their their general used to be set up with uh, using um, interlock works. Uh, we definitely do employ that on our clusters. So all of our nodes have an uh, interlock node, which reads the Docker um, event stream and looks for labels and then uses those labels to do service discovery. Um, and then above that in Amazon, we're definitely uh, employing uh, elastic load balancers in front of our clusters um, to, to load balance the cluster nodes. So with those two things coupled together, we have um, automated service discovery and load balancing. Awesome, man. Okay, I think we'll ask, let's go for one more. Um, I know there's some other questions, and if I don't get to them, uh, folks in the audience, I'll follow up via email, and, I, and I'll uh, make sure you guys get your answers. Um, let's see. Do you use a separate container for logging? Yes. So we definitely subscribe to the one container per, or one process per container rule. Um, so we have a volumes container that does our logging, and then uh, we use uh, syslog to dump that log into actually multiple different locations. Um, our, for instance, we uh, are using paper trail uh, application for um, kind of debugging efforts uh, because it's really nice kind of uh, real-time tail-like interface. Uh, our uh, Auditing group uh, has uh, uses Splunk and uses analytics to do some auditing. Our security folks have a sim called uh, Curator, so we kind of have this logging container um, that kind of collates all the information and, and ships it to um, a log reflector, is what we call it, which we also built in Docker, and that reflector has some rules in it to understand where the where the logs are coming from and which um, which uh, aggregation tools it needs to go to. And like I said, the multiple, and sometimes it goes to multiple tools. So that it gives us kind of that flexibility to um, have different departments see the view of the data that they want. Okay, and I saw one more question that came in. I'll go ahead and I'll take this one. It's around high availability. So um, how are the single point of failures handled? Is there redundancy in services that enables high availability? So. Uh, universal control plane and DTR are both come out of the box with high availability, right? So the ability to enable high availability. Um, in UCP, um, we have something called multiple uh, UCP controllers, and in DTR, we have multiple replicas. Right? So let's say like a, a node goes down, um, what we do is we automatically um, uh, fail over that application into a running node, right? So that you have that high availability. But, HA is absolutely um, possible and a feature within Docker Data Center. So I think at this point, what I'll do is I'll, I guess, close it down. Again, everyone, this presentation has been recorded. So what I'll do is I'll follow up with an email and include this recording. Sean, thank you so much for everything today. Um, and, and I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, guys. Of course, of course. Um, so everyone in the audience, we appreciate you being here, you know, taking the last 55 minutes out of your day to hear from us, and we look forward to having you join our future webinar. So again, thank you to the audience, and thank you to Sean. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone.